In terms of what the uh, lawyer to the court for South Africa said yesterday, Adila Hassim, one of the lawyers there, when he said that quote, as I just said, every day there is mounting irreparable loss of life, property, dignity and humanity, humanity for the Palestinian people. There can be no arguing with that, can there? Uh, I think the South African case is very sad because they basically decided to become Hamas's lawyer. And I paid very close attention to what they said yesterday. And it's as if they mentioned Hamas just to kick the, kick the box, so to speak. They, they mentioned Hamas and they acknowledged that maybe Hamas did some bad things on October 7th. But the fact that there's a war going on between Israel and Hamas is, is totally uh, 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 forgotten. It's as if Israel is, is, is acting in a vacuum in Gaza, that well, Israel is not acting uh, within the right of uh, every country to self-defense. Well, it's, but it's Mr. Regev, as, know, but as you know, yes, of course, Israel has a right to self-defense. But as you know, as a state, and particularly as a signatory to the convention, Israel does not have an unqualified right of self-defense. And what the South Africans are saying, and as you know, they are supported by other states around the world, what they're saying is the Iran way... Iran and Syria, well, yes, and other, and other countries in the global yes, yes. south, and, you know, even your allies, including the United States and the United Kingdom, who have st- stood four square behind you in many ways, have expressed concerns about Israel's behavior. We saw Lord Cameron the foreign secretary the other day, saying that he is worried that there may have been a contravention of international humanitarian law by your state in Israel. So this is the point. Of course, you have a right to self-defense. The question is, is how you're prosecuting and using that right. And the accusation again from South Africa and others to you is that you are abusing that right. So, so Lewis, let's be clear. I'm willing to have a serious conversation with, with uh, the Brits, with the Americans uh, about uh, Israel's tactics. Uh, we're always willing to hear uh, the thoughts of our friends and to engage and can we do a better job? That's a good conversation to have, but that's not what the South Africans are doing. The South Africans have adopted a uh, full you know, life, how do you say, it? in total, the Hamas narrative and they're accusing Israel of genocide. And there the British government, the American government, other Western governments have stood up and said this is just simply not true. This is a baseless claim. I think the Americans uh, said this is without any merit. Uh, and you have to distinguish between what is a valid argument, a valid discussion about our tactics. And we're always, as I said, willing to hear and learn from our friends and allies. But, but, but this, uh, this charge of genocide is totally preposterous. But the, it's outrageous. But Mr. Regev, I mean, isn't the case, isn't it the point that you have laid yourself open to that accusation in the manner in which you've conducted this war? 85% of Gaza's population have been displaced. The World Food Programme has said that 80% of the most hungry people in the world right now are in Gaza. That directly arises from the way in which you have prosecuted not just the war, but the way in which you have dealt with the humanitarian situation in Gaza. This was not the only way you could have conducted this war. That is the point. There were other options to you. You have not availed yourself of those options. Well, with your permission, I'll, I'll address what you raised in your question. It's true Please. that a large proportion, 85% of the population has been displaced, but why were they displaced? Because we asked them to leave areas of combat so they'd get out of harm's way. That has been documented. And 20,000 20, Gazans have died, over 20,000. Well, those are Hamas's figures. They don't say how many of them are combatants, how many of them are civilians. They want you to believe, and South Africa in the court wants you to believe that they're all innocent civilians, when that's clearly not true. But there will be many innocent civilians, will there not? Well, can you name, Lewis, and you're a student of history, can you tell me one war in modern history where, where civilians haven't been caught up in the crossfire? No, but I can't. Are you not holding, but I, I can't are you think... not holding Israel to a standard that no one else has held to? No, I'm holding you to a standard that is that of a modern state, democratic state, and that is better than Hamas and better than others who would attack, seek to attack Israel. And I can't think, I have to say, of of a war in which 85% of people, 85% of a whole population have been displaced. I can't think of a war where over 100 journalists have been killed in only three months. I can't think of a war no, no. other than, I can't think of a war, and that's from the American Committee to Protect Journalist figures, by the way. They're not my figures, and I can't think Lewis, of a war. Lewis, but let's be clear. Let's be clear. If you talk about the journalists, let's first of all state the obvious fact that Israel is the only country in the region that protects and defends the freedom of the press. We're the only country that has a press that can criticize the government. Hamas, of course, allows no free press whatsoever. So to, to, to con- predict or to, to portray Israel as some enemy of the free press is, is frankly ridiculous, especially when you compare to who we're fighting against. Well, but, but to be clear, on the first day of this war, on October 7th, when Hamas invaded our country with its 
army of terror and, and, of and randomly appalling. killed people. They killed journalists. Of course, they're now, appalling. But did they you kill would... them because they were journalists? They didn't kill them because they were journalists. They killed them because they were journalists. They could have been bakers. They could have been farmers. They could have been doctors. Hamas killed everyone indiscriminately. And that was completely appalling, and I would be the first one Correct. to say it. Nonetheless, we're talking about what has happened since, and of course... But to say that you Israel is deliberately high... targeting if Hamas I... propaganda, would you have you believe Israel, Israel deliberately targets I didn't journalists? Mention... That's just not true. I didn't That's mention... just not true. I didn't suggest that you would deliberately targeting, targeting them. But what I am saying is that it is a mark of just how severe and how profound the situation in Gaza is that so many journalists have been killed in such a short period. More journalists have been killed in three months of Israel's war on Gaza than in all of World War II or the Vietnam War. In 2022, which is when the invasion happened, 15 journalists and media workers were killed in Ukraine. In the whole of 2022, over 100 have died in three months. That is, I mean, the journalists are just a small part of all of this, but that is a sign of just how profound and totalizing Israel's action against the civilian population of Gaza has been. It's a, Israel's operation is against the Hamas military machine. Yes, it's not but, against the civilians. But the result, whether you say that it is against them or otherwise, the result is the same. The result no, has been to, the same. You're, you're, no, but you're, you're making a, a, sorry, a logical fallacy here. You're saying all the civilian deaths in Gaza are on Israel's hands. That's 100% not true. Uh, the, the well, they wouldn't be dead if it wasn't for Israeli rockets. No, they wouldn't be dead if Hamas hadn't had a deliberate policy, and not just Israel says so, the EU says so, the UK says so, the US says so, others say so, of deliberately using Gaza and civilians as a human shield for its military machine. I mean, you've had on this program discussions about Hamas's use of hospitals for its military machine, its use of schools, its use of residential neighborhoods. You see Gaza above, below Gaza, there is a subterranean network of military uh, um, uh, 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 tunnels and launching sites for rockets and command and control. Hamas leaders today are under the city of Khan Yunus. We're trying to get them. But so when South humans, Africa, so when, in their indictment, ignores that. It's I would, like Israel is there alone. There is no, there there is no doubt. War. There is no doubt that Hamas are terrible people and that they have used their own civilians as human shields. There's no doubt about that. So but you're saying, therefore, that when humans become human shields, that means they are just legitimate collateral damage in war. No. And you have no obligation no, to them at all. That. I never no, said but that's that. The logical, I never said that. That's your logical fallacy. That is, what no, your, wasn't that is the logical inference no, of what you're never, saying. No, well, so I didn't you have say no, that whatsoever. But you're saying that if they've that. died, you're saying that if those civilians have died, it's as a result of the fact that Hamas have used them as human shields, despite the fact that obviously they've died as a result of your attacks, your rockets and so on. So what no, is your but, what is your moral obligation to those people? No, but you, Mr. when you Regev? say to me, and you, when you throw to me the Hamas number that over 20,000 people have died, right? Well, the so UN. It's clear they're not all civilians. Plenty it's clear of, they're not all civilians. Yeah. It's, it's clear they're not all civilians. It's clear also a large part of the civilians died from Hamas tactics and Hamas munitions. And therefore, the whole, I mean, once again, I'm willing to have a serious discussion about Israeli strategy. But this South African approach, which is basically they've decided to be the lawyer of the Hamas terrorist movement, that's what they're doing, which says Israel is guilty of genocide without understanding that we're in a war, without understanding the difficult combat conditions, without understanding Hamas's strategy of using Gaza civilians as a human shield. It, it's like out of fantasy land. It's like a, it's divorced from reality. If um, let's imagine a situation in which the ICJ decides that uh, you are guilty of perpetrating a, a genocide, would that make any difference to what Israel is doing? My understanding of the court system is it'll be it maybe up to two or three years before we finally get a, a result from the court. But I have to tell you, there are questions raised, like uh, people came to us and said, why are you testifying in the court? Uh, and raised questions, and, and we've decided to go. But let's be clear, the court has uh, contains judges who don't come from countries with independent judiciaries, where you can expend... You can expect uh, the judge. Then why are you a signatory uh, to the convention if you do think the we whole thing is a waste we're, of time? I mean, the, we, we, we are, and that's why we're there in the end. I'm just raising questions that become relevant uh, when looking at the court. I'll, I'll ask you a question. There's a Lebanese judge on the panel. I mean, if he voted uh, against the indictment, he who knows what could happen to him in Lebanon? Yes, there's all sorts of considerations that need to be thought about. So your signatory... We have a strong case. We have a strong case. We're making that case today. I hope you have a chance to watch it. You're broadcasting now and it's going on as we speak. But Indeed. I think Israel's case is very, very strong. And people who are independent minded, who are who are legal scholars and just normal people with a sense of justice will hear the Israeli side of the of this case and understand that the so, South African allegation is baseless. So but to be clear, whenever it were to conclude, whether it's two years, three years time, 
you, the Israeli government wouldn't accept what it said because you are suggesting that it is not a proper institution or that the process no, is flawed in some way. I, I never said that. So I you would accept it. it. You I would just, accept it. I just point, look, the whole UN system, as you know, and as the British government has said, there's institutional bias in the UN against Israel. Right? Sounds, Mr. Regev, like you're just, it sounds like, Mr. Regev, you're just trying to discredit the institution in advance of anything it might say, which can I t- sounds can like I a sort you, of strategic... Lewis. A strategic decision from your government to do so. Lewis, Lewis, it's not Mark Regev and the Israeli government who talked about UN bias against Israel. Kofi Annan, a former Secretary General, uh, admitted as much. Co- um, uh, Ban Ki Moon uh, publicly addressed the issue. The trouble today you- is the current Secretary General, yes. I- 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 instead of combating institutional bias within his organization, has seems to embrace it. If you think that your case is so strong, why do you feel the need to try and discredit the institution? Why wouldn't you just say, well, the ICJ will doubtless come down on our side because uh, our case is strong enough and it will clearly be compelling. Because I'm aware of the institutional bias in the UN. I mean, you have all these votes in the United Nations where are these automatic majorities against Israel. It, it happens almost routinely. Well, perhaps uh, that's UK, because world opinion your is not on your has side. Spoken out against, the UK government has spoken publicly about the issue of bias in UN institutions. It's not new. To deny that is to deny reality.